host for today's global event. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us today. And on behalf of IDI, we're very happy to invite you to today's first event of the spring semester. Um, we have a bunch of very exciting things planned for the second half of the year here at IDI, and we can't wait to share them with you. And we'll talk about them a bit more at the end of the event. Today, we're very pleased to host Katrina Rupaivanska. She's going to be our speaker for today's event. She's going to help give us an inside look at the Polish government's efforts to assist refugees during the ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Katrina is the head of communications and public diplomacy at the Polish embassy here in Israel, um, serving since 2018. She is a career diplomat uh, and public expert in public diplomacy and storytelling. Before her posting here in Israel, Katrina was engaged um, in strategic planning and global analysis at the Department of Foreign Policy uh, Strategy at the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And before that, at the Chancellery of the Prime Minister in Poland, as well as assisting the Board of Strategic Advisors to the Prime Minister. Um, of course, on, amid the ongoing Russian invasion of Ukraine, Poland's government has promised to welcome all those fleeing the war torn um, Ukraine. Since the start of the invasion and with violence escalating inside Ukraine, Refugee reception points have opened to offering food and medical assistance organized by the Polish government to assist those seeking refuge. Um, refugees, of course, arriving in Poland from Ukraine have found accommodations with the help of citizens, private businesses, and of course, different organizations in Poland. Um, as, as always, today's event is gonna be um, broadcasted to all of our global chapters all over the world, including in Italy, India, Germany, and more. Um, as our past two events, today's event is going to be interactive, which means you will be able to ask questions during the event itself using the raise hand feature on Zoom. Um, you can also write to us in the chat that you're interested in asking a question, and we'll be able to stop Katrina for a moment, and you will be able to ask your question. Um, other than that, any other problems you might have, you can feel free to send a message to one of our staff members, and we'll be happy to assist with anything you need. Um, and with that, we're of course very excited to invite Katrina to start today's event. Um, and you, Katrina, you're, you're ready to go ahead. Yes, sure. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, good evening and good morning, probably to some of you. I'm very happy to be here with you tonight. Um, and I'm also very sad to be here tonight and speaking about the events that uh, I think all of us would love not to be happening. Uh, but, um, well, let's have this conversation and then let's spend some time on, on reflecting on what has been happening in my part of the region. I mean, I mean I'm based in Tel Aviv right now, but uh, all my heart is, uh, is in Central Eastern Europe right now. Um, so, um, yeah, please uh, let me start have, uh, presenting what I have prepared for today and let's have the uh, very candid conversation about what, what, is, uh, what is going on in, uh, in Poland and in Ukraine and in our part of, of, of the European continent. Um, as it was said, I, I work in the Polish embassy in Tel Aviv and I focus on, on, on public diplomacy here. I used to have the embassy for some time as well. I'm an expert in storytelling, so I may be a little bit talkative tonight. Um, so I, I asked Ben, to interrupt me whenever he sees anyone raising their hand and uh, willing to ask me a question or maybe add some uh, remark or a comment. Um, the title of, of tonight's event is Solid Solidarity Among the Nations, Polish Efforts to Help Ukraine. Solidarity Among the Nations comes from the organizers. I didn't come up with the idea, but I think it's a, it's a wonderful one. Um, because we are trying to be uh, to express as much solidarity towards our eastern neighbors and towards our friends from Ukraine, brothers and sisters of ours, as possible. Um, today, I'm going to focus on, on four main topics, diplomacy and politics, uh, the polls in action, uh, because it's uh, to a large, large extent, uh, it's the Polish society and the Polish ordinary people who have open their hearts and open their homes for the refugees from Ukraine that are causing so much buzz in the international media and international public opinion. Um, I heard in one of the interviews with our one of our ambassadors that we were called from zero to hero. I, I believe we were never zero, but we a lot of Poles are now expressing very heroic postures uh, um, and attitudes towards our friends in need. Um, then we'll speak about solutions for refugees, administrative solutions for refugees legislation that we have just um, had introduced in Poland so that the 
um, uh, the integration of the refugees uh, to the to our society goes much smoother, and so that the poles are feeling a little bit more in comfort of having um, people under their roofs for uh, for no one knows how long. Um, and then I'll end with some some serious message um, to all of our participants today. I didn't manage, I mean, I have 63 slides in this presentation. I'm not going to use all of them, obviously, and I'm not going to focus on all of them. But there is so much content that I could probably organize a, a semester long seminar already uh, and speak about the conflict and what has actually been happening since February 24th, especially in, um, uh, in Poland. Um, I closed the presentation today in, uh, in early in the afternoon, and I didn't manage to actually add another graphic that um, I found in the, um, on, on the website of Financial Times that is saying that Poland has become the fourth uh, largest um, host of refugees in the world within just two weeks. Um, we used to be on the 101st place. Uh, in the least among the states of the world, and now we are on the fourth place. So that says a lot about what we are going to uh, focus on um, on today. Um, let me see whether I can I can make it a little bit better. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's start from diplomacy and politics, and a little bit about the history. Uh, we as Poles and and Poland are very, very much um, accustomed or associated, or bonded with uh, uh, with history. We we um, we are addicted to history in a way, and we um, whatever we do, even in politics of of today, and whenever we are planning for the future, we are always looking in, um, behind our back, and we are looking about the history at, at the historical events. Um, I'm starting with this presentation with um, you know, don't look up. Probably everybody saw this um, uh, this film on Netflix recently. Uh, we, in our part of Europe, we are feeling, not only in Poland, but, but in, in Central Eastern Europe, we feel a little bit like, you know, we've been telling our friends and colleagues and partners from, uh, from other countries um, what Mr. Putin is preparing and who he is, because we remember very well from the history um, how such um, regimes operate and what they can do uh, towards their neighbors. Um, and well, we were feeling like Jennifer Lawrence and Leonardo DiCaprio that's, you know, we're trying to say to everybody, listen, you know, like a catastrophe is coming up and we felt that no one listened. Uh, or at least not, not listened, but it was so hard sometimes to believe that actually we, we were feeling a little bit like, I don't know if you know this gentleman, but he's my role model. Um, and I hope you know. Uh, this is Jan Karski, uh, a legendary, uh, a legend, a hero, a courier, um, an intelligence officer from the times of World War II, who managed to get to the office of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt during World War II, and alarm personally the president about what have what had been happening on the Polish so Polish soil, about the atrocities but what, that the German Nazis were were conducting uh, against especially uh, the Jews and the Polish Jews and the European Jews on Polish soil. He was trying to alarm uh, Pres um, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt about the Holocaust. He was alarming um, the Western allies about what, has, what was happening also against the Poles and other nationalities and ethnic groups in, uh, on the Polish soil and in our region. And he met not only with President Delano Roosevelt, but also with, um, uh, with the judge of the Supreme Court, uh, Mr. Felix Frankfurter, who said um, to, uh, you know, afterwards that he doesn't believe Jankarski. He didn't believe Jankarski, but it was like kind of a strange feeling that, you know, he didn't think that Jankarski was lying when he was describing every, you know, all the atrocities that he saw. He went to the ghetto, to the Warsaw ghetto. He went to the Izbica camp to see with his own eyes what was happening. So he had really good insights of what was happening, what had been happening, um, especially towards the Jews uh, during the Holocaust. And he was told that I can't, I don't believe you because I can't believe you. It's so horrifying that I simply, my mind doesn't, doesn't want to accept that. 
And we were feeling for years that, you know, we were saying to our friends and partners uh, many things about, you know, what is being cooked um, in the Kremlin. And we were feeling that, you know, like we were saying such horrifying and horrible things that actually we, you know, people didn't want to believe them. And these are just three, um, three things that I wanted to draw your attention to on the left side. And I'm sorry that it's in Spanish, but um, our amb previous well, former ambassador to Israel, Marek Magyarovsky, gave here in, in Israel two years ago, uh, or almost three years ago, sorry, an interview to, uh, to the Spanish section of the I-24, the Israeli-American uh, TV. Uh, and he was speaking about Russia. And Damian Pachter, who was, is one of the uh, gentlemen who was interviewing Ambassador Magyarovsky, has just recently posted a quote, uh, a tweet. He was right. I mean, he was speaking that we should be afraid of Russia and, you know, and so on and so forth. And he was right. And I'm, I'm in touch with Damian Pachter right now. We are cooking another article at, right now for, for another newspaper. In the middle, you have our president, um, Lech Kaczynski, uh, during the Russian invasion over Georgia. He and several other leaders of our region, they went to Tbilisi uh, during the invasion. And in the, in the main square in Tbilisi, he was saying, today, Georgia, tomorrow, Ukraine, and you know, to, the day after tomorrow, um, Baltic states, and then even, maybe even my country will be in danger of, of Russia. And again, um, not too many people wanted to believe that this is a serious threat. This is um, on the right side, you have an article from Political Europe that was published just a few year, uh, days ago with a, with a very good title, We Told You So. And it's, you know, it's, it's not funny and we are not very happy to, to be able to say, you know, we told you so, but, but we are feeling that, you know, that, 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 that these things that are happening right now may be maybe wouldn't need to happen if we acted, you know, like if we all acted as a community, as the Western community much more decisively, um, but we'll never know. Um, as I said, we are very, very much into history in Poland. And this is also another heroine that I wanted to tell you about. She's also one of my heroines and, and a heroine of many people in Poland. This is Anna Valentinovich. Um, she was Ukrainian, and then uh, after the war, during the war, she uh, she was moved to she moved to Poland. She had a very complicated biography, and I want just to touch upon one um, uh, one period of her biography, meaning uh, the times of the Solidarity Movement. You guys all are very very young, so you you, you uh, certainly don't remember the times of, of the Solidarity Movement. It was in the middle of the eighties. And we had uh, 10 million people um, trade union in Poland that inspired even more millions of Poles to oppose the communism, uh, to oppose communism and to fight for freedom of our country. Um, the Solidarity Movement and Anna Valentinovich was one of its leaders and legends. Um, it started uh, at the beginning of the 80s and within a decade, the communism was broken and we regained the freedom of our country. And I think pers personally that she would be proud to see how Poles and Ukrainians are actually now, you know, standing arm in arm uh, and uh, trying to work as much as possible together so that uh, as many refugees, especially women and children um, can find safe haven uh, in Poland. Um, and actually, you know, in our embassy in Kiev, you can see, you can, uh, there is a small statue of, of Anna Valentinovich because she was Polish Ukrainian. And I will speak about our embassy in Kiev right now. Uh, that's another uh, symbol of our solidarity with our Ukrainian friends. Our ambassador, Bartosz Tichotsky, uh, he's still there. He's still in Kiev. He said that he's not leaving. He has some serious job to do there. And he's uh, in our embassy in the middle of Kiev, um, aiding Ukrainians, helping them as much as possible. I will not dig into details. Well, I certainly do not know all the details of, of his work right now, but he is still in Kiev, in the capital that has been being bombed for over two weeks now. And, you know, the Russians are trying to encircle it and siege it. Uh, and he's saying that this city will not break down and will not be sieged. And this is another symbol of solidarity. As I said just a minute ago, um, 
that was the solidarity movement and this is the solidarity too and actually everything i'm going to talk about today is about solidarity um that's another expression of solidarity that i wanted to draw your attention to you probably i hope at least you saw this picture on the left uh, i saw it everywhere in the social media this is a, a railway station in Przemysl. It's the city in eastern Poland, very close to our um, to the border with Ukraine, and it's the main reception point that we have there. And you can see here strollers, simple strollers that were left by Polish mothers for the Ukrainian mothers who needed to flee um, Ukraine sometimes with the children in their arms and then when they cross the border they simply need a stroller because i'm a i'm a mother of two my, myself and i know how how heavy children can be we can carry them as much as possible and you know through many kilometers but at some point we just need a little bit of a rest we need a stroller and that's you know one of one of the expressions of, of solidarity that that the polish mothers uh, in Israel, there are so many jokes about Polish mothers you cannot believe. And I think, you know, that, that there need to be new stories of Polish mothers. And this is one of them. Um, a big, big heart of Polish mothers who are leaving the strollers. And it's not only in Przemysl. Uh, I saw many pictures from also other cities, whenever and wherever the Ukrainian refugees, Ukrainian mothers and children. I saw estimate that uh, about 90 90% of refugees from Ukraine now crossing the border to Poland are women and children. Uh, so you, you know that you know the, the, the size of the needs. You know these are just a, a small number of strollers, but they are everywhere. And every single railway station, station, every single reception point, you can find strollers left for the Ukrainian mothers so that they can lay their children into them. On the right side, you can see uh, a very different picture, but also of a stroller. Uh, I, I was allowed um, by Maximilian Rigamonti, one of the best Polish uh, war photographers, to use it in today's presentation. He's still in Ukraine, uh, taking photographs that I can, we are friends on Facebook, so I see all, all of his pictures and they are heartbreaking. He, um, he allowed me to, to show you this picture from Irpen uh, in Ukraine. This is just a left stroller because probably one, one mother uh, just had to leave it and run away. And maybe, hopefully, if she reaches Poland, she can just use one of the strollers from the Polish mothers. Um, one more thing. Um, yeah, I mentioned Netflix already. I mean, don't look up. This is another, um, this is the documentary. It's not science fiction. This is a documentary that I very much recommend to everybody who wishes to understand Ukraine and the Ukrainian dreams of freedom, of um, living the European future, uh, you need to watch this documentary. It's one of the best documentaries I have seen in, in years, probably, and it's about 2013-2014, um, um, when everything changed, um, when uh, the Euro Maidan was, was beaten up, when people were beaten in the streets um, because they wanted their country to get closer to the European Union. Uh, and when we are speaking about beating people up, I need to say that what's going on right now, it's not only about Ukraine, it's also about Belarus. Um, we all know that um, uh, rockets are, are being flown to, towards the Ukrainian territory from the Belarusian territory that Mr. Lukashenko uh, is one is the closest ally. I wouldn't use that. OK, let's stay with the world ally um, for, for the purpose of, of purpose of this presentation. But there are some less diplomatic ones that I could use. Um, he's the closest ally of Mr. Putin right now. Um, and he's beating up his people for many years. Mr. Lukashenko has been um, ruling has been the leader of the country uh, for, for three decades um, now, and he's been uh, introducing authoritarian and totalitarian regimes, uh, um, tactics into the country for, um, for, for many years now, and he's beating his society. And he's, uh, well, if Ukraine wins this war, it's going to be a different future for Belarus as well. We in Poland, we are helping Belarusians um, for many years now, and we have been having uh, a big influx of Belarusian people to Poland, especially since 2020. 
but it's been happening, you know, uh, the Lukashenko regime has been uh, awful towards towards um, Belarusian people for many years. So even when I was at my university, I had Belarusian uh, friends uh, in my group studying in Poland um, already who fled the country. Um, I was speaking about the European dreams of, of the Ukrainian people. Um, these are some numbers. Um, Ukrainians are dreaming to be in the European Union one day, and European Union is cooperating, has been cooperating with Ukraine for many years now, and especially since 2000 and, um, uh, 2014. These are the numbers. I will send you the presentation later, so you can you know, dig into the numbers much, much deeper and see how much the European Union has been investing in um, in Ukraine's development so that this country can be even more and more developed and more and more advanced in terms of, um, you name it, social equality, um, social development, labor market development, technologies, uh, also digital resilience that we can see very well in the internet right now that the Ukrainians are winning the digital war with the Russians. Um, another uh, side of the leaflet uh, saying, uh, telling you a lot about the cooperation between the European Union and Ukraine that has been ongoing for many years. And since it has been ongoing for many years, I need to underline that we are huge supporters of having uh, Ukraine in the European Union one day. Um, on the right side of this slide, you can see our president, uh, Andrzej Duda, who, who visited together with his Lithuanian counterpart, um, the president of Lithuania. They visited President Zelensky, Zelensky uh, just one day before the invasion. They went to Kiev just one day before invasion. So, you know, as I, as I was saying, uh, telling you here, uh, President Kaczynski and other presidents of our region visited, they flew to Tbilisi during the time of invasion, of the Russian invasion in 2008. Uh, here we have our president visiting President Zelensky just one day before the invasion together with the Lithuanian president. Um, there is also an initiative of several presidents, as you can see in the, um, uh, in the slide, in, in the tweet uh, in the middle. Uh, we are supporting uh, uh, several countries um, uh, to recognize Ukraine as soon as possible as a candidate country to the European Union. Obviously, no country can be become the European Union member, you know, overnight. It's a long-term process, and and it's uh, many many things need to happen, but they can happen. Uh, and we strongly believe that the place of, of Ukraine is in the European Union. Um, right, and when the invasion started, and actually, um, I mean, I think everybody was, it was hard to believe that the European Union was so united from the very beginning, right? I mean, as the democratic um, community, we usually like to have arguments within the European Union about many, many different aspects. And also, but, but when it comes to the sanctions, we were very much united that we need to introduce some sanctions against Russia and against Belarus. For the reasons I have already mentioned, uh, we need to introduce them as soon as possible and they have been introduced. There, there is one packet of, of sanctions after another we as Poland are, um, are of, of in the position that we want even stronger sanctions uh, against Russia and against Belarus. And we keep negotiating and keep pushing for that uh, in, in the European Union circles. And we'll see uh, what we can do. Uh, and we'll see you know, how many packages of sanctions we can introduce uh, in the future. It's not only the European Union, obviously, that is introducing sanctions. We have also strong sanctions uh, from the side of the US, from the side of Canada, but also even Switzerland and, and Monaco have joined um, uh, some of the sanctions. And it shows that, you know, it is a clear thing that, uh, and, and it's not surprising that Russia now is the most sanctioned country uh, in the world. Um, we are also saying in Poland, and I think the European Union agrees, I mean, agrees, everybody in the European Union agrees that it's a European challenge and the European mission to help Ukrainian refugees. So 
uh, I mean, my whole presentation today is, is filled with, uh, with um, uh, you know, screens from Twitter because I'm spending a lot of time on Twitter, unfortunately and fortunately, but it's so encouraging to see so many, you know, positive postures and gestures um, on, the, on, on the part of, of the whole European continent. People are coming to the border between Ukraine and, Ukraine and Poland and they are picking up people, total strangers, total strangers from Ukraine, mothers and children and grandmothers, and they are picking them up from the border and they are just, you know, taking them under the roof in Denmark, in the Netherlands, in Spain, in France, in many, many other places. And it's so heartwarming to see that it's, you know, like we have so many Europeans engaged into aid in Ukraine on many, many, uh, many levels, also on the very, very human person to person, people to people uh, level. Um, but we feel that it's not only um, uh, the obligation and the mission of, of the European Union to stand up to the challenge. Um, as I said, it's, uh, it's the polls that I'm going to talk about uh, tonight. It's the polls that open their hearts and homes, but the scale of the, of the challenge, and we'll speak about the numbers in a second, is so huge. That we need um, that we need a lot of international support towards so that the, uh, the, the so that we all can meet the challenge. So it's not only about the Western sanctions, but it's also about the Western values expressed towards the Ukrainian refugees. We already see a lot of international organizations. I'll speak about them uh, in a second. Working on the border and with refugees and internally displaced persons um, in Ukraine. And we, we see them engaged in not only on the border, but also throughout Poland, because refugees are right now are all across Poland. Uh, we see also uh, a lot of international aid, humanitarian aid, uh, material goods being developed, uh, being, uh, being transferred to the border and to organizations working both with refugees in Poland with, and with internally displaced persons in Ukraine. We have also started having very serious conversations in the European Union and outside of the European Union in the whole Western world about the relocation of the refugees. Um, why? Um, okay, we'll skip NATO for a second and we'll come back uh, to NATO in a, in a bit. This, uh, uh, these are the numbers from, from the UN um, Agency uh, of Refugees, UNHCR. Um, you, you can see these numbers here, and, and I just said that you know at the beginning that Poland has become the fourth largest um, uh, host uh, of refugees um, in the last two weeks. But we uh, are expecting uh, we are expecting maybe even four or five million people coming to Poland, uh, depending on how long the, the war is going to take and and what results of the war uh, we will see. If we are supposed to be having five million people on the Polish soil this will you know need to be addressed by uh, by huge international community and we'll need people to be engaged so that we can jointly uh, relocate um, some of the refugees because it's simply we are getting closer and closer to, 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 to a moment when um, when when the need uh, and necessity for the huge international uh, support uh, in the relocation efforts will be um, simply necessary. And obviously, when we are speaking about um, the, the Russian aggression against Ukraine and, and the war that they, they started, we need to speak, speak about, uh, about NATO. So, you know, I just didn't want to um, discover America um, again and again. So I just took these three simple questions from the NATO website. Um, how has NATO supported Ukraine since 2014? So the annexation, uh, the annexation of Crimea that obviously no one recognizes and the Lugansk and, and Donetsk uh, People's Republic's establishment. And you can see that NATO has been engaged into Ukraine for, for years already. And well, Ukrainians are heroes and they, they have very strong and, uh, and badass soldiers and, and leadership, military leadership as well. 
but part of, of, of why they are so strong and so well equipped and so well trained is the fact that the cooperation with um, and, and uh, you know with with the, the assistant package as we can see here comprehensive assistant package was has been in place. Um, what are NATO and allies doing to help Ukraine? You can see here, uh, it's a very, very uh, responsible language that is being used by NATO. And we need to understand why it's being used this, um, uh, this way. And again, what is NATO doing to defend its countries and citizens um, from Russian attack? You, uh, if you do not know much about NATO as an alliance, defense alliance, uh, we, uh, it's not an aggressive alliance, it's just a defense alliance against um, invaders. Uh, one needs to know that the, the, the biggest motto of, of, of NATO or, or the biggest, the most profound uh, principle is one for, all, one for all, all for one. And this is what, uh, what all the members, um, all the signatories, uh, you know, member states of NATO believe very strongly in. We are like musketeers. We, we will fight for each other and we will defend each other no matter what. And this is clearly what, what is been happening uh, right now when we see that the eastern flank um, of NATO is, is getting more and more and more troops, it's getting more and more equipment and we are as strong as, as it can be. I see one raised hand. Benayahu, I don't see the surname, sorry. Yes, one sec. Can you open, Let me your open camera, the camera? Please? Yeah, for sure. Good evening. Um, okay. Yes, I wanted to ask a question about NATO. Mm -hmm. um, I'm asking about like the formal uh, legal obligations arising from uh, joining NATO or being a friend of it. And it, I believe, um the fifth article is regarding um you know actually participating in war for the territorial integrity or security of one member and i wanted to know uh how relevant is the nato treaty actually is it uh is it being modified is it uh does it reflect reality and is it suited for a global uh crisis like we see now so um that's a very good question uh if you follow the um, speeches and remarks of, of the main politicians and main leaders of the of the member states of nato in recent days everybody is using the same phrase we will defend every single inch of the nato territory and that's um, um, that's the basic or the bottom line of, um, of NATO existence, as simple as that. I mean, there is no way that NATO territory can be attacked. And if one member of NATO uh, is attacked, then the whole alliance is attacked. And the whole alliance will respond fiercely. That's the bottom line. That's the major, the, the most important principle. That's the all for one, one for all principle in practice. If one uh, member state is uh, attacked, the whole alliance will respond profoundly. Okay. Um, and speaking of which, um, this is also, this may be interesting to you on the, just yesterday, we were celebrating on the 12th of March, and I remember that date, um, you know, very well. Um, in on, the, on the 12th of March in 1999, we joined NATO together with, uh, with the Czech Republic and Hungary. And this is one of the most important dates in our, in the, in the current history of Poland. Joining NATO is for us, as was a breakthrough, we felt safe for the very first time in ages. And we still feel safe as a country. Of, of course, we are scared because of what is happening and because of the war. But at the same time, we can you know, be sure that we have our friends and allies behind us. So yesterday we were celebrating in a way because you know, it's, it's still hard to, you know, like, celebrate with fireworks whatsoever uh, during these days. But this is a very important date and we were observing this date. Um, also on Friday, uh, we had a very um, ceremonial assembly of, the, um, of our MPs and senators in the Polish parliament. 
and the Secretary General was speaking of, of NATO was speaking at that event, but he was not the only guest of this um, of this ceremonial assembly of, of Polish MPs and senators. Um, also, our president, of course, spoke at the event, but also another president spoke at the, um, this event, and that was President Zelensky. Uh, that was one of the most moving, I mean, he's a very good speaker and we all can see that, that he's very motivated, that he can motivate all of his compatriots and all of Ukrainians to defend their country as much as possible and defend it fiercely. And he was having also a very, very emotional and very, very important and strong speech towards the Polish public and the Polish parliamentarians. Long live free Poland and long live free Ukraine. If we go back to history uh, for a moment again, um, in Poland since, um, I think it's, it was um, the November uprising in 1830-31 um, that we had, uh, you know, Polish, Poland was not an independent country back then because we were torn up by, by, by three countries. And in 1830-31, there was a big uprising in Poland against the Tsar, against uh, the Russian empire. And there was this saying that was, um, that was written on, on the flags um, of this uprising, we are fighting for yours and ours freedom, because it was not only the Poles who were fighting the Tsar, there were many other um, ethnic groups who were united during that uprising. And we feel today that the, our Ukrainian friends are fighting not only for their freedom, but also for our freedom. And if, you, if, you, uh, if any of you is based in Israel, and I'm sure many of you are, there is Mount Herzl, obviously, in Jerusalem. And there you have a very, um, one of my favorite monuments in, in Israel. And it's devoted to the soldiers, to the Jewish soldiers who fought for Poland's freedom in, during World War II, 1939, 1945. And you have this inscription also written there on this monument at Mount Herzl. Zawolność naszą i waszą for ours and yours freedom, because also, the Jewish soldiers who fought in the Polish army during World War II, they were fighting um, uh, for, for, for all of our freedom. Right, coming back to the numbers. So you can see a huge influx of, of, of people to Poland. You can see I took this, uh, this tweet from, uh, this is, these are today's numbers from, from the morning. Um, Big numbers, right? I mean, it's just 16 or 17 days, and we have received um, over 1,600,000 people um, in, in Poland. Um, I need to underline, as you could see at, at one of the previous slides, that some of um, that that a number of, of people obviously left for other countries already. Uh, in in on this. Um, map from from BBC, you can see a number of two two thousand. Uh, 210,000 uh, people that left to other countries. But let me draw your attention also to some other countries that are receiving a huge influx of, of, um, of refugees from Ukraine. And, and one of, of, of the, the, um, the biggest heroes of, of this whole operation is Moldova. It's a very small country uh, that has received uh, probably the biggest number when we count for 100,000 inhabitants. Uh, but it's not only Moldova, you, we have refugees also in Romania, Hungary, and of course, Slovakia. Um, these people are fleeing uh, war. Uh, these are, as I said, probably 90%, uh, these are women and children. Uh, these are people who are seeking refuge, who are seeking safe haven. And on our borders, they can feel that they are safe now. Our president some time ago when he, he's speaking with President Zelensky every single night and he, he, he told him simply that, you know, Ukrainian men, you can fight and you can fight fiercely. Don't worry about your wives. Don't worry about your children. Don't worry about your mothers. We will take care of them. And we are trying to do as much as possible as the Polish society and the European society uh, to take uh, care of them as much um uh, as much as possible right um the solidarity as i said and the simple you are safe now uh it starts with a simple leaflet on the border on the very first hours of the of the invasion we already had this information being distributed to um uh, to, to the refugees 
where you can you can read uh, if you are escaping from the armed conflict in Ukraine, you will be admitted to Poland. From the very first second of the invasion, we started accepting refugees from the very first second. No matter what, no matter how, people were fleeing um, armed conflict. These were women and children and, um, and they just simply needed help. And they are still getting uh, this help. Uh, they are getting this help on the border that, you know, obviously the screening is going on. We have accepted uh, people from over 160 countries now. It's, uh, it's not only the Ukrainian people that had to flee Ukraine because of the war, but there are also people from, from other nationalities and other ethnic groups as well um, that are crossing the Polish border. So we were, you know, there were many international students simply um, in Ukraine during the invasion and they were all, you know, seeking refuge in, uh, in our countries and I'm speaking about, you know, Poland um, uh, tonight especially. Um, everybody has been welcome and has been, um, has found refuge and safe haven in Poland. I'm not saying that everything was going, you know, like very, very smoothly, obviously not to uh, to actually clear 100,000 people sometimes, or even more than 100,000 people during a day by the border guards and then in reception points, it's simply not that easy. And it sometimes cannot go as smoothly as, you know, we would love it to go. But our border guards and our reception points have been uh, accepting sometimes 120,000 people a day. Since we are, I am speaking uh, with the Israeli-based organization, I wanted to underline, of course, that we are also helping uh, Jewish refugees from Ukraine. Um, I, rec I very much recommend to you the interview that was published by the Jerusalem Post with our uh, Deputy Interior Minister Bartosz Grodecki, who is from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, of course, um, and he is a legend of Consular Affairs section. Um, and now working in the in the interior ministry and he's speaking about many different actions that we have been introducing in Poland towards the aid um, to uh, refugees. But he's also speaking that um, Poland helped a Moscow rabbi who opposes Putin to leave Russia through our territory and as far as I know he's now uh, in, uh, in Israel. Um, many, many Jewish institutions and organizations are working uh, both in Poland and on the, on the border uh, with Ukraine and on the other side of the border, I mean in Ukraine, helping people flee Ukraine, Jewish people flee Ukraine right now, um, and also working with the internally uh, displaced persons. I also recommend to you this uh, article from Haaretz about Poles opening their hearts uh, and houses and homes. Um, to uh, to the uh, to the Jewish refugees because that's the main topic of um, uh, of this article. Um, there are many different actions that are being you know conducted on the border and through the border. One of them and most heartbreaking, uh, but also the most important ones is the evacuation of. On the left side, you can see the uh, the story of CN uh, written by CNN about the evacuation of the term terminally ill children from Ukraine. Uh, these children, you know, they, they are terminally ill, so they will live for more for like maybe two, three, five months. We don't know how long, but but they are very, very, very ill and they had to be evacuated because the Russians are also bombing hospitals, so they had to be evacuated. And this is a very moving story. I very much recommend everybody reading it, but you, you, you will need to have some napkins. Um, these are on, on the right side, in the middle and on the right side, you can see the pictures from uh, several transports of, of um, sick children from, from many different hospitals in Ukraine that are crossing towards Poland. I saw on Twitter today that another train, um, like it's, um, you know, hospital train uh, has left Ukraine towards Poland. We have um, our best doctors involved in, in this operation, preparing, you know, preparing the, the little patients to, uh, to go to Poland and taking care of them on our side uh, of the border, uh, mainly in, uh, in, the, in the Central Ministry of Interior Hospital in, uh, in Warsaw, but not only. I mean, the scale of the challenge is so big that we, that, that people, that children also transferred obviously to other, um, other hospitals. 
but we do not only care about humans, we also care about animals and pets. Uh, from the very beginning of the war, it was clear and it was announced broadly that people can flee with, together with their um, cats, dogs and other animals. And also our zoos are um, organizing evacuation of animals from Ukrainian zoos. Again, it's not always going very smoothly because it's not easy to evacuate 10 or 15 lions, for example. But um, our zoos are very, very much um, experienced in taking care of such animals and taking care of evacuation of such animals. One or two years ago, we had a very famous case of, uh, of the Poznan Zoo that um, um, there was a case of smuggling tigers um, uh, through the Belarusian border. And, uh, and they just took all of the of all of the tigers, took care of them, and then sent sent to other places, um, for example, to to Spain. So we are trying to look after animals as well, obviously. Um, diplomats, because you know I am diplom I am a diplomat, so I need to tell you also about the diplomats working on the border. Um, all of this action with admitting people, with clearing people, wouldn't be going smoothly um, as, I mean, as smoothly as possible, uh, but it wouldn't be a, possible to do uh, without the involvement of diplomats of many, many countries who are establishing their own reception centers on the, um, on the Polish border or in Przemysl near the Polish border and in other places, also in Warsaw, um, but especially on the, on the eastern border. Diplomats of other countries who were, for example, posted to Kyiv and then evacuated, like um, you can see Irit Yaknes from, she's my friend from the Israeli embassy in Warsaw. Uh, Irit is based, has been based in Warsaw, but um, the team of the Israeli embassy in Kyiv has been evacuated to Poland and that now they all work on the border together. We are sometimes trying to exchange messages with Irit, but she's so, so tired and working around the clock that I'm just, you know, uh, just sending her brachot uh, and greetings and warm greetings and that's just, just it. But we have diplomats from all over the place being involved on the border so that they can take as many po people as possible and accept them and take care of them afterwards. Um, because, uh, you know, most of the, of the people who are under the, the care of, I don't know, let's say the British embassy, the Brits who are fleeing Poland, uh, Ukraine, uh, sorry, um, through the, uh, the Ukrainian Polish border, they will go to the UK. Obviously, they will not stay in, in, uh, in Poland. We have international organization working around the clock at the Polish border. Uh, World Food Program, all of the agendas of the United Nations. Uh, Samantha Power, who is also my role model as a diplomat, and I very much recommend you guys uh, following her on social media and all over the place. Now she's the uh, administrator. Uh, the director, let's say, of, of USAID, so the biggest um, uh, and, and the official state American uh, um, agency responsible for, for the development and humanitarian aid. Everybody is working around the clock on the Polish border. Um, international organizations, um, they are bringing aid, they are coordinating efforts, they are uh, also taking statistics, they are um, simply, you know, sometimes collecting even toys. Everybody knows what they are supposed to do, and they do. Work on the border is like the work 24-7, and everybody is involved and everybody is engaged. And of course, nothing would be possible on the border uh, without the involvement and engagement and hard work, again, 24-7, of NGOs and private people. And they are doing many, many different things from the transportation, you know, like people, as I said at the beginning, people just stand with a, with a sheet of paper, you know, saying, I can take two people to Warsaw, I can take five people to Wrocław, I can take five people to Berlin. But people are doing many, many other things. You can see, you know, three young guys, they dress up as Winnie the Pooh, the tiger and Mickey Mouse so that, you know, children are less scared in, um, I think it's, it's, uh, it's in Przemysl. There is also, you know, one German person, uh, one person from Germany brought his own piano to the border and he is playing, the, you know, he has been playing there so that people, you know, feel a little bit less stressed and sometimes people, the, the refugees are playing on the piano themselves. Um, we have um, 
Polish Humanitarian Action is a it's an organization that has been um, experienced in humanitarian aid for decades already, and they are also obviously on the border. They are they are one of the main actors on the border. Um, also, Caritas is a is a Catholic Church organization that is also working around the clock, and many many other organizations. And not only organizations. Sometimes it's just and, and in many cases it's just regular private people uh, who felt that they need to go to the border, they need to be volunteers, they, they need to give out soup, uh, you know, warm soup to the people who have been working, waiting, you know, it's, uh, I, I, I heard that it was like, last night it was minus 11 um, degrees Celsius on the border. So you can imagine the scale of, um, uh, of the challenge that uh, people are, are facing there. Um, there are so many people working on the border that it's, it's really even hard to, count them. Um, but the aid needs to be pr um, uh, provided also in Ukraine. Um, so we have many buses, come, you know, crossing the border. We have uh, convoys on trains crossing the border. As you can see here, the statistics from our governmental agency of strategic reserves, uh, 7,800 tons of humanitarian aid were transferred through this agency already. Uh, and here's another story also from our ambassador to Kyiv, um, who just, uh, it's from March 11th. Um, people from Świno Ujście, it's near Szczecin in Poland, northwestern part of Poland, so close to Germany, they brought um, aid to the oncology hospital, children oncology hospital to Kyiv. I don't know how these guys did it, but they did. So people are even able to go to Kyiv that is supposed to be encircled by the Russians, but it's not. Um, you can see the scale, you can see how, how many different actions people are doing. My personal here and the, and, the, and the organization that I'm personally supporting is the Polish Center of International Aid. I have been following their actions for many years and I'm very um, amazed by, by what they're doing in many different parts of the world. Uh, in the during the war, in, uh, in, right now they are, for example, evacuating people from Kharkiv. Uh, yes, Kharkiv that is also encircled and being, you know, the the target of, of Russian invasion and rockets and attacks. They are also organized. They have organized a wonderful action of evacuating wives and children of Ukrainian firefighters. Ukrainian firefighters have a lot to do, obviously, right now. And this organization handled the evacuation of their families so that they can focus on what they have to do and they do not need to um, uh, worry about their uh, wives and uh, children. Yes, Benayahu. You have a question? So they have about this picture. I don't hear you. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but, but, but I'm sorry, but you are freezed and I don't hear you. If you can just leave the question on the chat, please just write the question on the chat and I will respond, okay? Because I don't hear you, the connection with you is very low. Very, uh, very slow. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, coming back to this presentation, uh, Martin, you have a question. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, there. Uh, I really appreciate this is very, very good. And I'm a Canadian. Um, and uh, so we're not, we're not that close to it uh, geographically but we do have a huge Ukrainian um, and I'm impressed with the way Poland has reacted to this. And I think that's wonderful. My question is, is uh, I was in Ukraine in 04 for the Orange Revolution. I was there as an election observer in Kiev for a couple of weeks. And then they sent me or our smaller group of three or four of us were sent to Luhansk for the actual election itself. I came away from there almost believing there are two Ukraines. Uh, the Ukraines that see their future with Europe and the ones in Luhansk 
and apparently colleagues of mine that were in Donansk saw the same thing, where they really saw their future on to the east. Um, so I almost felt the issue was there was two Ukraines. Uh, perhaps he didn't mean to do this, but it would seem that Mr. Putin has been able to unite Ukraine <laughs> to the whole to go west. Um, having said all that, um, while we can, you know, we will find no uh, a way to like Mr. Putin's actions. There has to be a solution here. And I, I guess I would ask you this, uh, outside of defeat, which is unlikely of Mr. Putin, what's the off ramp here? I don't know if there is anybody who knows. Um... And uh, I personally, I mean, I hope for the defeat of the Russian army. And uh, I know that it's uh, it's a very complicated um, uh, dream to have. And actually, it's uh, it's it's a very optimistic one. And maybe you know, like it's it's going to be very very difficult. But I hope for that. And I hope you know, Mr. Putin not only united Ukrainians. And we can see the polls that are, you know, still somehow being held in uh, among the Ukrainian society. That you know, ninety percent of people support uh, President Zelensky, for example, and ninety-eight percent support the Ukrainian army. So it, it is a very united country uh, right now. Um, I don't know if I have a smart answer to this question. I mean, I, I wouldn't like to draw scenarios that can sound silly. Um, I mean, I, I'm, it's just so complicated right now and no one is inside the head of, of Mr. Putin. Uh, what I, but, but what I know is that he not only united Ukrainians, um, and I spoke with my, my friend from Ukraine yesterday for, for over 45 minutes, we're still there in the country, he sounded so motivated, just like President Zawaiski uh, and, and his advisors and you know the Minister of Defense and, and, and Mr. Klitschko, I mean two uh, Mr. Klitschkos. Um, so like the whole country is united, but not only, I feel that the West is also united and yes. that, that we know that Mr. Putin needs to end up in The Hague and that's that's, that's for sure the scenario I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that, that for, for what is happening right now, he needs to end up um, in front of the, of the, of the court in, uh, in, in, in The Hague. Um, Kate, you have a question also. I used to use name Kate uh, many years ago. Uh, so, yeah. Would you like to ask one? Okay, Kate, if you could, because you're frozen, also, if you could. Uh... Uh, now, can you hear me? Yes, I, yes, we can. I, I yeah. hope, I mean, uh, I do hear you. Yes, I wanted to ask you about uh, fighter planes, uh, which uh, Poland uh, will probably um, um, Transfer to you, uh, transfer to Ukraine. So, is anything being uh, being done at the moment? Uh, because um, Ukraine is uh, actually uh, asking. Uh, Ukraine has been asking for two weeks already to close up its uh, sky, and um, it's the biggest problem. It's the most serious problem right now. So. Um, do you know anything about uh, the fighter planes from uh, Poland to Ukraine? Our government uh, has made a clear offer. Uh, we said, I mean, our government said that it's ready to transfer MiG-29s uh, that we have at, uh, at, in our Navy to the, uh, the American base in Rammstein in, in Germany, and then to you know, give it under the disposal of the NATO. Of NATO. Uh, but we also need guarantees, you know, it's one third of our Navy, and we cannot you know, just simply uh, lose a one third of our Navy and stay unsecured and, and unprotected. So, uh, um, and for now, this offer was not accepted. 
uh, and we'll see. Uh, I mean, I think, and um, but I'm not going to go into details that there are many, many different things that are being discussed also with the Ukrainians. Um, but it's probably too classified to, to discuss openly. Uh, the issue with the fighter jets with the MiG 29s was discussed um, partly openly, and for now it's a, it's a no go. Um, so so it's it's not happening. Um, and we'll see probably other other scenarios being played out. Um, right. Thank you. Coming back to the presentation, I, I, I wanted to yes. underline the, the wonderful work of, uh, uh, of, of the Polish Center of International Aid and to draw your attention to one very important thing, because we, uh, I work in Tel Aviv, so overseas, and I have friends in, in, in obviously and colleagues in embassies of ours and also in other embassies you know embassies of other countries working across the world there is one important thing because everybody wants to help right now and wants to aid refugees and wants to aid ukraine and the ukrainian people in internally displaced persons and ukrainian army and so on and so forth one needs to understand especially when you are located overseas uh the the most efficient way to aid the efforts, you know, the stand with Ukraine efforts right now is to donate to professional and trusted organizations. Uh, we were approached many times by people of goodwill who started collecting material goods, um, you know, bandages, blankets, um, you know, even food. Uh, this doesn't work well, on, you know, with this scale of the challenge, with this scale of the crisis, um, collecting goods when you are located, you know, in, in Israel, in Canada, in Argentina, in Australia, simply is not the best idea. The best thing that you can do if you really want to help is to donate to professional organizations. I pre prefer, prepared these two leaflets. One is about the Polish organizations that are working in the field, and one of them is obviously the Polish Center for International Aid. And I, uh, the other, the, the second leaflet is uh, is with the QR codes, the websites um, of international organizations that are working with the refugees and internally displaced persons. If you want to aid uh, these efforts, please donate money, but please also donate money to trusted organizations and trusted fundraisings. There is so much scam in the internet. I also saw this scam myself. You know, in many times in the internet. Uh, if you really want your money to be used uh, professionally by professionals, donate professionals, not just some random collections. It's very, very uh, important. Right. Um, reception and transition points are located not only at the border. We have reception points and transition points all across the country right now. Um, all the major cities, all the biggest cities uh, are filled with refugees. The population of Warsaw grew during the last two weeks, grew by 15%. Um, the scale and the influx of the refugees from Ukraine to the biggest cities is just so big that we have that people, um, both the authorities, local authorities especially, and you know, uh, regular people and NGOs, started a, you know a, a campaign, an action to. Um, encourage people to go to smaller towns and cities. There is still place in smaller towns and villages also for people to uh, find safe haven, find refuge, find a roof and, um, you know, um, they, can, they can sleep under. My family, my mom lives in a, in a village and close to her village there are many refugees already. Uh, in, in, in my hometown there are refugees already my hometown is a very small one on the border with Russia. I grew up on the border with Russia and I, I think I know what, what Russia is. Um, so like we have refugees all over the place, uh, all over the country and everybody is trying to help them. Um, Poland has turned blue and yellow. I was, um, I was recently told that it's really hard to actually find a Ukrainian flag in any store right now. Um, they're all sold out. Uh, people are, you know, I have friends who have some skills when it comes to suing and people are suing flags themselves because it's so difficult to find a Ukrainian flag in a store right now. Whole country turned blue and yellow. 
and it's so heartwarming i think also i mean especially for for the ukrainian refugees to see their flags all over the place um, and also quite suddenly poland has become a bilingual country um and pretty much overnight i mean we have been having an over i think over a million ukrainians um uh, a minority of, of, of um, over a million ukrainians since 2014 um so uh, again there are people who already spoke ukrainians and we had signs in ukrainian in many restaurants in many um offices and so on and so forth but now we have the ukrainian language absolutely everywhere and and also i think i'm, I'm also from the generation who still had russian you know as an obligatory language in my primary school uh, and and I'm seeing that, you know, my friends are dusting off uh, their, their Russian skills now because, you know, obviously many, uh, many refugees speak Russian as well. Uh, so like the, the, the whole country is actually either learning Ukrainian or trying to recall some Russian at the moment. And it's, uh, it's also so wonderful to see, um, you know, from the outside, in my case, that Polish um, media are also producing um, uh, programs in Ukrainian, that Polish uh, websites are having, you know, Ukrainian language versions right now, that we can see leaflets with the Ukrainian phrases all over the place, that our trams have signs in, in Ukrainian and so on and so forth. And I see three hands raised up. <laughs> Galit. Uh, could you could you say a little about how the government is working and coordinating everything uh, logistically regard for instance uh, how many meetings how how does the it, it, it looks like a very big operation so I was just wondering for for the case of other countries that have less of an effect from the uh, from the refugees um, uh, how how is it working um, uh, uh, at, at, on a day-to-day -day basis? Right. Um, I need to say that for during the first week, I was actually we were trying as the embassy uh, actually not to contact our headquarters too much. I mean, we were uh, we like everybody was so busy and it was so crazy is not a good word, but but that was crazy the first week. And uh, well, everybody has been working around the clock. We here, you know, like we again working overseas, working far away. We also are working around the clock on the on the conflict. Everybody has their own tasks, um, and the coordination is getting better and better. It's it's pretty obvious that you know from, since day one, it's it's a huge challenge for everybody and a huge um, task. Uh, that that actually almost every single, not every single, but let me show you. Um, there is a poll. Uh, I, I found a poll in, in one of the newspapers in Poland that says that already 75% of the Polish society has been somehow involved in aiding Ukrainian refugees or Ukraine as such. That also means that we really need coordination that needs to go, needs to be better and better. So now we are actually, and with also, you know, like the bigger and bigger numbers coming uh, of people coming over to Poland, the, the, um, the coordination needs to simply, you know, get more and more and more advanced. So one of the uh, one of the first things that we actually were informed about was a was a was a web service where people who wish to aid Ukraine and wish to organize help for Ukrainian refugees they can register there or find information on how to do it uh, so that we do not have too many random uh, random you know for example collections of, of of bandages right and then we will uh will not be able to do anything with them because it's it's a real you know huge logistical you as an expert in, in these issues you know that it's a huge logistical um uh problem um in, in this service, people can also organize aid convoys to Ukraine because it's, you know, it, it doesn't work in a way that one can just easily cross Ukrainian border and, you know, like, or there is no border, right? I mean, you, aid convoys need to be organized and they need to have proper documentation and so on and so forth. So this service also helps, um, helps in doing that. 
Um, we have just introduced new, new legislation in Poland. It was accepted by the, by the parliament today. Uh, that is organizing and trying to structure the whole aid uh, that we are um, um, having or you know, conducting towards the refugees in Poland. So basically the refugees from Ukraine are gaining the access to labor market, to social services, family benefits, education and healthcare. Uh, they are permitted to stay in Poland for 18 months um, and they have a possibility to extend it to three years, so for another three years. Uh, and also Poles who are hosting refugees are getting, um, you know, refinancing for, for their expenses. Um, there is a central certain amount of money that people can get um, daily. Uh, several questions, uh, several examples, you know, um, how this really works. First of all, all the information is available in Ukrainian. Uh, that is, you know, very much, very, very important. But again, it's, you know, it doesn't happen like that easily. I mean, one would imagine that, you know, you need to have some time, you need to find translators, but we have Ukrainian community all over the place. So basically the information in Ukrainian is, in, is available since day one. Um, this is the, you know, for example, when it comes to the access to medical care, uh, this is the hotline with, um, I, I don't know how to call it in English, like audio consultations, you know, phone consultations um, when it comes to some mild diseases that people may, may be having. Um, there, is, um, um, uh, there are several hotlines. There is also a hotline for, for patients um, who have cancer. This is also a very serious problem. And there is a, a hotline for, for patients working in Ukrainian, you know, for, for oncology patients. There is also a, a short track for, for people who used to be doctors um, in, in Ukraine and want to continue their careers in Poland. And there is a short track, you know, how to actually get access to, to the labor market when, when you are a doctor. Um, we, um, we do not have enough doctors in Poland. So, so this is, you know, again, also a benefit for, for the country. Um, we also have, uh, this is a private initiative that I found, Znany Lekarz um, is a web service, the most popular web service in Poland when one can find a doctor that they, you know, in their neighborhood from a certain profession and so on and so forth. And now it works also in Ukrainian. It's a, it's a huge, huge database of, of doctors. And it's not only, you know, random doctors, but it's also about doctors who speak Russian, Ukrainian and English. So it's, it's also a very important thing. We also already have procedures when it comes to COVID vaccinations, uh, quarantines for people who are coming, you know, refugees uh, who are coming uh, to Poland with, um, uh, with COVID. We have procedures when it comes to vaccinations of children because every country has a different calendar of, uh, of, of vaccinations and we needed to, you know, adjust one to another. Um, Social services in practice. We have also um, uh, a hotline in Ukrainian when it comes to when people can ask questions about the social services that they are entitled to. Um, we have information in Ukrainian and the huge and, and the whole procedure when it comes to um, uh, retirement and, and access to pensions uh, in, in Poland. Uh, there is also um, a hotline when it comes to the evacuation of children from, from Ukraine. And also, as I said before, I think um, uh, the Ukrainian refugees are entitled to get family benefits that we have in Poland for every single child in, in, in the Polish families. Polish families are entitled to get 500 lot a month. Um, social servicing practices, you know, um, e-visits uh, in, in the um, office of um, uh, social insurances. I'm sorry, but just too many languages. This is Ukrainian, then to Polish, to English, it's just uh, sometimes too complicated. Um, uh, there are some, again, information about the, uh, the social benefits that people can be entitled to, not only the family benefits that I already mentioned, um, and and uh, um, what else? This is a huge database when it comes to uh, vacancies um, and availabilities on, on the labor market. And again, it works in the Ukrainian language as well. Um, here are all the information when it comes to functioning in our labor market. The refugees have regular, normal access and full access to the labor market already in Poland. Uh, it is important not only for the po Polish labor market that because we have many, def you know, huge deficits in certain professions, but it's also important for the refugees.
to actually stand on, the, on their feet. Many refugees want to work from day one and they seek employment uh, and they are, uh, they are ready to do it and they are uh, eligible to do it. Um, we also have uh, procedures when it comes to the access to education. The children of, um, of refugees are already uh, in the Polish schools. So, you know, as soon as children are ready and they you know, ready mentally, you know, like uh, they are not scared anymore, you know, of, of leaving the place, for example, because kids are scared, right? I mean, children are, are in, in a lot of stress. As soon as they are ready, they can go to school. And if they are not ready, they can, they, they have easy access to psychological help. Um, there is also um, Polish universities are accepting students from Ukraine who had to flee Ukraine and so Ukrainian uh, student refugees and there are several programs I mean many programs uh, where through uh, and through them students can Ukrainian students can continue their education uh, higher education in Poland uh, in many many different faculties and universities I mean it's all across the country uh, another yeah, important Oh, we just have two more people um, raising uh, their hand. Okay, just like one last question because then I'm, I'm going to finish this topic. I mean, one last thing that I want to say, the security of refugees and safety of refugees is, 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 a, is a serious challenge. We uh, have seen some um, news um, and some alarming tweets that, for example, there is a risk that there, there some bad people trying to do some human trafficking uh, are appearing, you know, in, in transition points, in reception points. So the, 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 the police, uh, the police is doing their best to, um, uh, to look after the, uh, the refugees also from this aspect. There are NGOs who are already involved and engaged. I saw yesterday the press conference of the mayor of Warsaw on the topic together with the foundation La Strada that has years of experience in, um, uh, in freeing women from being, uh, you know, uh, the victims of human trafficking and so on and so forth. So we see this, um, uh, this threat. Um, the Polish uh, authorities and Polish NGOs and Polish local authorities, um, and we are trying to address it as, as, as well as possible. Miłosz. Yes, hello. Hi. Thank you, Kasia. Um, and uh, hello, everyone. I'm Miłosz Kodos. I'm, I'm a professor at the Danish Institute of Studies, and I'm also a researcher at the Lund University in Sweden. I'm based in Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, I've known Kasia for many years, we cooperated together. I was just, uh, I was very curious about this, this, this workshop or this presentation here. And I just want to tell you that I am um, running a course in the European Union, how it functions right now and uh, how it thrives on challenges and obstacles. And I have a group of American students. And obviously the, 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 the crisis in Ukraine has been the focal point of our, of our lectures uh, these days. Uh, we just came back from Brussels and have been many, many interesting meetings. So what I wanted to tell you is that if you confront everything that the Russian propaganda has been saying about the conflict in Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, how Russophobic many people in Europe are, and then you confront it with the situation on the ground, and everything that, for instance, Kasia has been telling you about, then you see that the reality on the ground is very much different and we need such meetings. So I strongly encourage you to attend such meetings, to confront everything you hear about with facts, with reliable sources and with things that, for instance, Kasia is presenting uh, to you right now. You can see everything um, in her presentation, all the data, all the sources, it's all there. And it's very important that we all also spread the word to our friends, to friends of our friends, so that we all know what this war is about and that it all affects us and will affect us in the future. So I wanted to thank Kasia for this presentation and for uh, many such meetings she's been having in the recent days. So uh, carry on and uh, good luck with everything. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Miłosz, for good word. Jakub. Um, hi, Kasia. Um, it's very interesting to to uh, hear what you were saying about Ukraine and, uh, and the current situation right now. Well, my question would be rather personal, I would say, on the rather personal ground. You said that you grew up right next to uh, Russia, right next to the border with Russia. Um, I was actually wondering, um, how does the border with Russia look like right now, the, the current border? So, so I know, um, I know that well, probably nothing, nothing special. But I was wondering whether 
uh what is what about the the fence what is there is there any fence on the border because i remember when that was the refugee situation uh with belarus when we didn't even have a border a proper fence uh so i was wondering whether uh the border with russia is uh, quite different um that is one and two uh if the border with russia is different what has changed uh right now is there anything that changed is there anything that you can tell us about it thank you Good question. I do not have a good answer to, you know, when it comes to what is happening now on the border with the Kaliningrad Oblast. It's a, uh, it's a part of Russia that is a, an exclave. Uh, you, you guys just open the map and you will see it's, it's um, uh, up north from Poland. I grew up on a, on a very uh, specific border, you know, in a, in a town that is located six kilometers from the border. Uh, and my husband, uh, I will show you, uh, Okay, this is my family, not a complete one, uh, because we also have a daughter now. Um, and it's in Lviv in Ukraine, and we will not have time for, for this story. But my husband comes from the border with the Czech Republic. And when we met in Warsaw, of course, so in the middle, um, and I went to see, you know, to, to see Cieszyn, and his hometown for the very first time, I was shocked. Because, you know, like, you do not see any border there. I mean, you know, it's, it's a... Uh, Cieszyn is a small town uh, located on the river, and the, the other side of the river is Czeski Cieszyn, so, so the, uh, the, the part of the town that is in the, in the Czech Republic. And people go, you know, like this, because now it's Schengen, but even before Schengen, it was still, you know, local border traffic, and, and, uh, and everybody was just, you know, like um, living in Czeski Cieszyn and going to school in, Polish, in, in, in Cieszyn on the Polish side, or having a business on the Czech side. And that, that was so normal that there is no barrier, there is nothing there, you know, people just were friends and families and so on and so forth. When it comes to our border with Russia, with the Kaliningrad Oblast, it's totally different. And you really, you, you, do not, you didn't even have to have a you know, physical fence to, to feel that there is a border. And it's a border with Russia. It's totally different. We were not, you know, going to Kaliningrad for a weekend or for an afternoon. I person, I myself, I I was in Kaliningrad maybe once. Um, so yeah, totally different uh, border. We had local border tra traffic for a few years, uh, and it worked very well. I need to say uh, it was it was so nice to see so many uh, Russian tourists coming over, spend, you know, spending time during weekends in Gdańsk or in Austin in Poland or in my hometown. They were coming to my hometown to do big, big uh, shopping and so on and so forth. But it's not working anymore uh, for, for many, um, as, as far as I know, security uh, reasons. So very different borders. Um, and yeah, growing up on the Russian border was much different to growing up on the, on the Czech border, I need to say. Um, well, it's probably very late and I do not have enough time to tell you everything I wanted, but uh, we knew that. I just want to underline um, and well, maybe there will be some more questions that what has been happening in Poland for the last two weeks or so is simply beyond any expectations actually of anybody. Um, I need to say that when, when the war started and then when I you know, was observing my Facebook feed, I'm, I'm old school, so I'm on Facebook. I, I, I cannot do Instagram. I mean, it's, it's just not my cup of tea. But my Facebook was just filled with, uh, with like good, you know, like people were united. People were doing their best and they still are. I mean, still my whole news feed on, on, on Facebook is filled with people, for example, searching for, uh, you know, uh, they accepted some refugees in their home and now they're searching for employment for them. Uh, or I saw a post today, listen, apparently we have the winner of Voice of Ukraine in our home right now and he wants to practice his singing skills again, you know, after, after these few days of trauma. Can you, can you help us find the teacher of singing uh, for him? I don't know the name of the person and the, the edition of Voice of Ukraine that he won, but you know, like these stories like this, uh, I, I saw, you know, people just, you know, leaving everything behind and going to the border to pick up some families. 
I saw people who were cooking, um, you know, like barsh ukrainsky uh, or simply chicken soup together. I saw people who were, you know, like this girl in, in, in on a train, uh, because we have this regulation that uh, Ukrainian refugees do not have to pay for train tickets at all. Uh, and, and she was just, you know, showing the proof that she paid zero zloty for her train ticket. Uh, you can see, you know, Vitam, of course, say welcome to Poland or over the place. People are really running extra mile by an extra mile. And this is simply incredible. It's not the story that we went from zero to hero. We have always been like that and we have always known, and it's still, you know, somewhere in our DNA that we know uh, what the war is and we know how horrifying and horrific war is. And my people and my country know that when people, our friends, our brothers and sisters from Ukraine, and, uh, from Ukraine are attacked, we need to help. And we are doing our best to help. And we'll keep on doing that because we know that the Ukrainians fight not only for their freedom, but also for our freedom and for all the security and freedom of Europe for the future. I'm going to stop here because it's 2028. I mean, 28 past 20, uh, past eight. Um, if there are any other questions, I'm very much open because I still have a lot of a lot of things to say. Um, and as I said, I'm very talkative, so I can talk for ages. Uh, let me just draw your attention to Mariupol, to what happened a few days and has been happening in Mariupol. And let me tell you that it ha this has to stop. And we, you know, never again is a, it's a very powerful slogan. We need to stand by this, but also glory to Ukraine, Slava Ukraine, Ukraine. Uh, I'm terrible at Ukrainian right now, but I will, uh, I will, I will learn Ukrainian for sure. Um, and let's stand with Ukraine. Thank you. I'm done. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much to Katerina, of course, and to everyone who participated today in the event. Um, of course, we want to thank Katerina again for coming to speak with us today. It was an honor for us to hear from your you know, very vast knowledge on all different aspects of the topic. Um, it was very interesting for me especially, but I'm sure for everyone as well. Um, so yeah, that's going to be the end of the event for today. Um, Katarina, I don't know, like you said, if anybody is interested in asking you um, any more questions, if there's any way to get in contact with you to get more involved yeah. uh, moving forward or so uh, the, the best way actually to get in touch with me is to find me either on Twitter or on, on LinkedIn. Mm, I'm, uh, I will respond to, to every question and maybe, you know, if you need some information or maybe you would like to organize a similar discussion or presentation about what is actually happening uh, in, in, in Poland and, you know, on the Polish-Ukrainian border. I may not be in the country, but I have very good insights. That's part of my job as well, um, to have good insights. So I, I'll be very happy to stay in touch with you and to um, help you get as much um, good info and good coverage as, as possible. One last sentence that I need to say, and it was mentioned by Miłosz, um, please verify your, your sources. Um, there is a lot of disinformation in the internet. There is a huge, huge com disinformation campaign. Before you retweet something, before you share it on Facebook or on Instagram or wherever, please verify your sources. In journalism, it's usually you have to have two sources before you publish um, uh, something or anything. Uh, during the time of war, please verify at least in three sources. Thanks a lot. All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, of course, you can feel free to keep up to date with us and with IDI um, on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. And we, of course, hope to see you all in the future at future global events and activities. And we wish you all a great week. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody. very much. Good night.